Hello friends, it's unfortunate that I cannot be present in Lyon for this wonderful meeting which is my favorite meeting and I've been asked to speak on standard constraint whilst correcting deformity. So there are three key points that I would like to talk about. Why not use constraint for all cases? When to use constraint and how to avoid constraint? Why not use more constraint for all cases? The Norwegian arthroplasty register over the last 20 years has shown a very poor survivorship for more constrained implants as compared to unconstrained implants as you can see from this survivorship data. Also in a recent meta-analysis, rotating hinge prosthesis have a poor 11 to 15 year survivorship with a very high incidence of complications like infection, dislocation, aseptic loosening and patella problems. Also using a block of plastic cannot substitute for an unbalanced knee. These will fracture or wear out and the cost of hinges can almost equal that of a Renault quid. So when should one use more constraint? When there's collateral damage, like of the MCL in this case, or if the LCL is severely stretched out in this various deformity, that's when to use a constraint implant. If the medial collateral ligament is stretched out in this valgus knee, that's when we would use constraint. If there's a neuropathic joint, like this one, a hinge is a good idea. Likewise, if there's a huge flexion gap and the jump height of the post exceeds the flexion gap, that's a good indication for more constraint. And lastly, if there's extensor deficiency like in a poliomyelitis patient. So how can we avoid using more constraint implants? What's the technique? So let's first assess the deformity and see whether it's varus or valgus, intra or extra articular deformity, where there's, uh, whether there's flexion or hyperextension, and whether there's femoral or tibial torsional deformity. MRIs have shown that the MCL or the LCL does not get damaged. It is merely tented by osteophytes and we've seen hundreds of these MRIs. What contracts is the posterior joint capsule, the posterior oblique ligament, and the posterior and the oblique popliteal ligament. In valgus knees, it's the popliteofibular ligament and the arcuate ligaments. The opposite collateral ligament can often be very severely stretched as shown here. We've uh, reported how to correct deformity without releasing the collateral ligaments. First, let's look at the steps in a varus knee. We recently published this paper in the Bone and Joint Journal where we looked at nearly 500 consecutive varus knees and we have not used any constrained implants in all these cases. In about 10% of them, merely by exposure and excising the cruciates with no release except for the deep MCL, we were able to achieve alignment and balance. When we resected the osteophytes, 59% could be aligned and balanced and only the remaining 31 needed a reduction osteotomy as shown in this example where uh, there is extra articular deformity. We remove the posterior medial flare of the tibia and that helps to reduce the tenting of the medial collateral ligament. And this is the post-operative x-ray showing the effect of the reduction osteotomy and the achievement of alignment and balance. And two millimeters of bone removal can give you about one degree of correction. Now in this 31 degree varus deformity after removing the osteophytes is down to 12 degrees. After reduction osteotomy it's down to 8 degrees. So now what do we do? So that's where we do a posterior medial capsular release like in this patient who is imbalanced in extension but perfectly well balanced in flexion. So here with a 15 mm insert it's balanced in flexion. So we remove a posterior medial uh, capsule and then insert a 15 millimeter trial and now we are we have complete stability in extension right through the range of motion and this is the patient at 48 hours with the x-rays and here you can see on navigation it's perfectly balanced and aligned so the remaining 31 percent of patients required either reduction osteotomy and or a PCR to achieve alignment and balance 
with no need for any constraint. Now if there's an extra articular deformity, one may need to do a sliding medial condylar osteotomy as in this example where the x-rays can be seen before and after surgery. So this is an animation of the technique. When you have a trapezoidal gap, we slide the medial condyle distally along with the attached MCL till we get a rectangular gap, fix the condyle with a couple of screws and this is the patient at three months showing an excellent range of motion and a perfectly normal gait and we reported this in clinical orthopedics. Now if there's an extra articular deformity one may need to do a, a wedge resection followed by nailing and a navigated total knee. On, a, on the tibial side this extra articular deformity required a wedge resection followed by a long stem. Now in valgus knees most of them do not require any release like in this patient on an anesthesia. If the extension gap is very tight laterally, we release the IT band and the posterior lateral capsule and that should afford full correction. If that does not occur, we do a lateral epicondylar sliding osteotomy and we've used only five constraint implants in the last 150 consecutive valgus knees. So in this example, there's a valgus deformity of 15 degrees, which corrects only to 5 degrees. It's perfectly balanced again in flexion. So we now do a lateral sliding osteotomy, slide it distally uh, by an amount required to bring the extension gap to a rectangular gap. Now we fix it with a couple of screws and we have complete stability right through the range of motion and we have achieved alignment. This is the pre-operative x-ray of the patient and the post-operative x-ray with the clinical result. Now, if the extension and flexion gaps are both tight laterally, this requires a posterior lateral corner release, particularly of the popliteofibular ligament. If the hypoplastic or worn lateral condyle is present, then we need to slide this distally as well as posteriorly, especially in these long-standing flexion contractures. In this patient with valgus and hyperextension, we've done a lateral sliding osteotomy, no need for any constraint, and that's a patient at four years. This extra-articular deformity again was treated with a combination of intra and extra-articular correction. So one can achieve stability with attention to alignment, balancing the gaps, component size and placement, and using constraint only as a last resort. This is the summary. Most deformities can be corrected without releasing the collateral ligament and without more constraint. I thank you for your attention.